action. <laughs> Good morning, Good morning. <clears throat> and welcome to Church in the Garden on a lovely Sunday morning. It's great to see you here. It's great to worship in the, in the creation that we have here. <clears throat> and uh, I'm Greg, and I invite you to, if you haven't picked up a song sheet, it was on the table as you came in, and that way you'll be able to belt out the, the songs as we, as we celebrate this morning. I was giving Brad a little bit of a rough time, because again it said in the emails, the one and only. No, I guess it says our, our, our own. Not the one and only, our own. Yeah, I belong to all of you. <laughs> You're responsible for this. It's a chance to grow. And what doesn't kill us, something like that goes on, right? So we welcome you here today. Hey, uh, there, will be, there will be snacks and beverages served after worship this morning. If you need a glass of, of water to wet your whistle just before we start singing, it's right over there on the table. And... Uh, if you're doing nothing for lunch, maybe you can think about the Frog City Cafe as, uh, as a place for your lunch today. And it just is a way of us appreciating Scott and Ken and the crew here at, at Linden Gardens. Did you get the email? If you didn't... No. If you didn't, well, you're, you're an exception. You are an exceptional person, Bill. And uh, eventually, two of them. someday, someday, it might come your way. But we're told today to be prepared for a bit of a surprise. Pastor David's here today. That must be the surprise. So I'm going to call upon Pat to lead us in worship this morning. Morning. This morning's morning. call to worship is morning. It's so beautiful here. Um, this morning's call to worship is Light by John Philip Newell. May the angels of light glisten for us this day. May the sparks of God's beauty dance in the eyes of those we love. May the universe be on fire with presence for us this day. May the new sun's rising grace us with gratitude. Let Earth's greenness shine and its waters breathe with spirit. Let heaven's winds stir the soul of our soul and fresh awakenings rise within us. May the mighty angels of light glisten in all things this day. May they summon us to reverence. May they call us to life. Good morning. I'm David. I don't work at Linden Gardens, but I do work. Yeah, let's begin to stand. Let's awaken to the beauty around us, the beauty within. And if you feel the urge to clap, go for it. Don't worry about being on beat. I'll worry about that. You just worry about expressing yourself.
creatures of our God and King. All creatures of our God and King. Lift up your voice and with us sing. Oh, 
Jesus is to stand firm. song um, Canvas and Clay should be on that first page
When I doubt it, Lord, remind me I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay. To make all things work together for my future and for. There's a healing light just beyond the clouds. Though I walk through fire, I see clearly now that I know nothing has been wasted, no failure or mistake. You're an artist and a potter, not a canvas and the clay. Let's remember, you're not finished with me, you're not finished with me yet, you're not finished with me at no. all, you're not finished with me yet, you're not Thank you.
It seems like it was only a week ago that we were here singing praises and uh, uplifting the Lord. How was your week? Good. You had a good week? Good week. You made it through the heat okay. Oh, yeah. I tell you, down at, down at Gleaners, we had a group in from Richmond, 14, 15 year olds. And I was working with one young fella, Brandon. Him and I, now you got to picture this. We're dumping compost. Vision that. Flies. Compost. He says to me, I'm just new at this Christian thing, and it's fun. <laughs> I never knew dumping compost could be so exciting. But I'm sure it was more than that. So in your prayers this week, we're just going to ask you just to, you know, just jot down a few, a few prayer requests. And if you can just think of Meredith, again, as she continues in her, with her ongoing treatments. And let's just bring up uh, Margaret to the Lord too, that she will get the need and the support she needs in, in her staying at home. Let's continue to hold Lillian and Bill in prayer. Burke, as Lillian transitions into full care. And uh, Bill is tired. He's tired and he needs a rest. But uh, the, one, the, the, head, the head manager or administrator at Westview told, Bill was telling us the other day, but they, Westview told him, you will only be here five days a week. You can no longer be here seven days a week. And I will tell you what days you will be here. So he gets Wednesdays and Saturdays off. But I don't know. When I had to work at 6.15, he's coming into town. So whether he's gone to triple O's all night for where he used to work. But uh, just continue to uplift them as, as, as Lillian transitions into, into permanent care, into long-term care. And then Bill. It's kind of funny. Some of you may have met his grandson, Patrick. Patrick's in the Army. He's been transferred from New Brunswick now to Cold Lake. Cold Lake? Cold Lake. And he says, Grandpa, I only got three more years and I can move back to 101 Lake Hill. I said to Bill, I said, the next time he tells you that, you got to tell him, no. The house was built for old people. It's got wide hallways, wide doors, levers, not taps. It's built for old people. You can't be here. <laughs> And also uplift Mary uh, in your prayers as she, as she undergoes medical issues and, and, and treatments. So let's just spend some time in prayer this morning, shall we? Can I add a praise? Sure. Uh, I'd just like to praise the Lord that Linda has found, they found another new treatment for her cancer, and she's excited about it. Mm. This is Rita's sister, Linda. Uh, she's been battling cancer for a while now, and now there's... 20 years she's been battling cancer and just this week she takes on a new treatment she uh, and she's quite excited she's quite excited so if you can just add Linda to your prayers this week also almighty God on this morning we look around us we marvel at your creation how you've transformed this orchard into a beautiful garden of peace, tranquility. We can see your, your hand in all the work here, and we just give you praise for that, Lord. Just fill our hearts with compassion for others. And as we think of that, Lord, we just uplift Meredith to you, Margaret, Mary, Bill and Lillian, you know each one of these. Each one of these people is your child. Wrap your arms of comfort around them. Wrap your arms of peace. Continue to work with the doctors and nurses with Linda as she undertakes this new treatment for cancer. And that there will be times to rejoice and sing praises. 
you brought us here this morning. Just bless Brad as you give him his, as you give him your words to speak this morning. And that we will celebrate your mightiness as we come to you this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, this is a reading by Richard Wegemies. Like most of us do, I spent a lot of time trying to compress things into a context I could accept. That was hard work. And it meant I was alone most of the time. Nowadays, I figure life is pretty simple. Creator is everywhere. And divine light shines through everything and everyone all the time. My work is to look for that light in those fleeting, glorious instances when I see it, I am made more right then, right there. A Blessing for Equilibrium by John O'Donohue. Like the joy of the sea coming home to shore, may the relief of laughter rinse through your soul. As the wind loves to call things to dance, may your gravity be lightened by grace. Like the dignity of moonlight restoring the earth, may your thoughts incline with reverence and respect. As water takes whatever shape it is in, so free may you be about who you become. As silence smiles on the other side of what's said, may your sense of irony bring perspective. As time remains free of all that it frames, may your mind stay clear of all it names. May your prayer of listening deepen enough to hear in the depths the laughter of God. the right way there we go Ooh, I'm loud morning everybody good morning I know everybody here you know I'm Brad uh, I'm filling in for David this week and uh, we're going to keep with our theme of miracles um, and if anybody was watching the world juniors last night the uh, absolute miracle save that happened was phenomenal go if you haven't seen it go watch it it's, it's bananas but anyway um, <laughs> We're going to keep with our miracle theme, and I'm going to share a few miracles where I feel uh, that God is speaking to me, reminding me that he's there. Uh, and I also feel like these mini miracles point to God's sense of humor. And I truly believe that our creator has a great sense of humor. I mean, he created a platypus. He's like, eh, it's a duck. It's a beaver. Smoosh. And we'll make it venomous. Why not? Right? Like, it's goofy. <laughs> So what do, I, what do I mean when I talk about mini miracles? Well, um, in my life, one gift that I seem to have uh, is that uh, stuff, and I'm talking normally in the tech, tech, you know, techie stuff, computers, that sort of thing, will often just start working whenever I walk around. Um, in my job, I'm a, I'm a systems analyst, and many times people will call me over to their computer saying, this button doesn't work. I pressed it like a hundred times, and I'm following the instructions that I probably wrote, and of course I wrote them right, um, and uh, it, just, it just doesn't work. And like, I 100% I believe them. I believe that they are doing their best to follow the instructions. I believe they're clicking the buttons, um, and I believe they're saying what they're doing. Um, but when then I roll up in my scooty chair, so you know, to cross the office, you scoot your way along, get up next to the computer, and I ask them, I'll be like, okay, so what are they doing? And they go, okay, so what I do is I go along and I click this button here, and oh, it, it totally starts working. And I'm like, I just did that. And I'm like, yeah, I know you did. It's, it's okay. This, this happens around me. It's a thing. You know. Um, so we've talked about being conduits for miracles, and that's apparently my conduit for miracle. You know, I'm uh, able to solve minor IT problems. You know, Peter gets to walk on water. I get to help you delete a stubborn email. So, like, I'm, I'm, ba I'm basically Peter. <laughs> I don't know what triggers or causes the, 
this effect or, or causes these mini miracles, but I believe it's that it's my faith that the issue will be resolved. Like I had faith admittedly in this case with an application, one that I've used for like 15 years, I'm very familiar with it. I have faith that it's gonna work. I've you know done this a bunch of times, it's gonna work. There's no reason why it won't work. And I don't have any reason that it won't work in my mind. Like there's no, there's no doubt, it's just gonna work. And I think that confidence, um, and my confidence is held up because I've done this so many times. I know it's going to work. So I've seen this time and time again where ap applications will work like they're supposed to. And the funny thing is, the people that seem to have the most issues tend to be people who just don't trust the software outright. Like they haven't even looked at it. They walk on in. They're like, I, that's a computer. I'm scared. That's not going to work for me. And as soon as they do that, it's like the, the system's like, oh, I sense your fear and your doubt. And it just <laughs> falls apart. Um, so yeah, they even feel that the system is personally out to get them. <laughs> so what I try to do is take the faith I have in my well-practiced trade and start applying it to my life like faith in God. So I'd love to be able to be like, totally, that works, and apply it to my life. Like if you could just get to a place where you have so much faith or confidence that God's program is running as intended, you could walk into any situation and just know. Like, you can scooty chair yourself up to difficult challenges and roadblocks and just know that God's plan or program is going to run smoothly. And it's okay, and it's working as intended. But if you don't have that confidence, but, but what if you don't have that confidence? You know, every now and then I get on a bit of a bad streak. I get into some situations where maybe my application isn't running the way I want it to. Um, and I can find sticky bugs and weird data that I just, I can't explain. Your faith can waver, and sometimes you need that minor miracle or a string of minor miracles to kind of renew that in you. So such was the case when God recruited, recruited Gideon back uh, to take back land for the Israelites. So we're going back into Judges chapter 6, and uh, David has mentioned this a number of times. This was a particularly tumultuous time. There's lots of judges, lots of direction. The Israelites aren't really doing what they're supposed to do. Um, they kept, um, they were basically getting uh, beat up by the uh, Midianites. Uh, they kept dipping their toes into following Baal, who we now refer to as the god of the porcelain throne, thanks to uh, uh, Elisha for the sick burn. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, we, a couple of videos back, listen to David's uh, talk about Baal. Uh, anyway, the Israelites were not doing so hot, there couldn't be, it again was with the Midianites, and they were, the Midianites were taking their livestock and they were, they were taking all their grain, so they kept raiding the Israelite land, and the Israelites ended up living in caves, um, and it was yeah, just really bad. But the Lord heard the cry of the Israelites, and eventually he took pity on them. He decided to find Israel a champion to drive back the Midianites and retake the land for his people. So the angel of the Lord appears to Gideon and his father while Gideon is threshing wheat inside of a wine press. And I thought that was really interesting because like the only wine presses I know of are like either big steel industrial ones or like the little hand crank ones. And I'm like, how do you fit a Gideon in there? Um, and then I looked it up and old wine presses were like these they look like big swimming pools with like a smaller pool below it. So I assume you'd like throw all your grapes in the big swimming pool, stomp all over them, and then it would run into the smaller swimming pool. So it's like the swimming pool in the hot tub or the grapes and wine. Anyway, it was interesting. And we're in wine country, so I spent way too much time researching that. Um, so if you don't want Midianite stealing your grain, apparently you have to uh, thresh it in wine press. Um, so uh, the, angel appears to, the angel of the Lord appears to Gideon and I'm paraphrasing, but he says, hey, uh, you're pretty strong there threshing away. Uh, God wants you to get the Israelites out of this trouble and restore the glory of God in this land. But Gideon, Gideon had grown up dodging Midianites and losing goats and grain, so he was a bit skeptical. And Gideon said to him, oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why then has all this happened to us? We are his and we, where are his miracles, which our father told us about, saying, did, the, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. Uh, it's uh, chapter, th from verse 13. Uh, so God let out what I can only assume was like an audible divine sigh <laughs> and told them to go prepare a sacrifice. 
Then he goes, and I'm paraphrasing again, hey Gideon, you want a miracle? Boom, here's your miracle. And then whoosh, all this fireball goes up and totally consumes the sacrifice. So uh, again, God, God delivers. Gideon asks, God delivers. Um, and who is impressed by a good, good fireball, right? It always makes for good miracles. Well, that got Gideon rolling. He was pumped, but like not 100% committed pumped. You know, he's 75% there. So God asked him to charge into town and tear down an altar to Baal. And he did go do it, but he like snuck in after dark. He wasn't like, again, not 100% confident. He's like, okay, but I'm going to just sneak over and do this when no one can actually see me do it. And the people of the town were very upset. Uh, but his dad told him to, to relax and that if Baal was really mad, that he would take care of uh, Gideon himself. Of course, when he was done with the laboratory. So he'd be like, yeah, Paul, if you're so great, solve this problem or, 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 you know, strike him down. But that never happened. And, of course, nothing bad happens. So the Lord says, okay, let's get these Midianites out of here. Let's crew, get a crew together, and we'll run them out of town. So a bunch of other tribes come together, but Midian catches wind that there's a couple of buddies getting together. And so then they have a couple of friends, and it's going to be like this old school rumble. So trumpets are going off, summoning all the Israelites around it's getting crazy but again Gideon wasn't super confident the Midianites again they've been they've been throwing punches at him all his life and they look really tough and they've been bullying him around so he's pretty intimidated so he's like um god like I, I know you did the whole fireball thing that was super cool and you got all these guys to come when I blew the trumpets and they all showed up um but are you sure we can take them so this is what happened so we're in uh, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 36 in, in Judges. So Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you've said, look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. And if there's dew on the, on, on the fleece only, and it is dry on the ground, then we shall know that you will save Israel by my hand. You have said, by my hand, as you, as you have said, sorry, and it was so, when he rose the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung out the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said, okay, God, that was cool. Don't be angry with me, but let me speak just once more. Let me test, I pray, just once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, but the ground around let there be dew. And God did this, so, did this, did this that night, and it was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on the ground. So Gideon, again, just needs constant reassurance. He needs these minor miracles. Again, fireball may be a little bit bigger, but, you know, wet fleece, not a major miracle, but it's something he asked for. So then Gideon went into battle, and through these miracles, Gideon's face was, moved, was renewed. So setting, again, setting aside the spontaneous sacrificial combustion, a damp cloth isn't much of a miracle. But when you're looking for something to actually happen, and often against odds, it does happen, it renews your faith. When you cry out, God, give me a side, and then like the bus rolls by that says, you can do it, written on the side of it, and you're like, oh, that was coincidental. Or like a butterfly boat floats by, and you're like, I just need a sign, and this you know thing lands on your head or something. Those look funny little miracles, but it's when you're calling out and you feel recognized. Um, I grew up uh, Catholic, so of course we had saints who intercedes on our behalf. Uh, saint Anthony was the patron saint of lost, lost things. I'm not sure which Saint Anthony, because I think there's like six of them at this point, but one of them is the patron saint of lost things. So whenever I've lost something, I typically uh, put out a call saying, uh, hey, Tony, can you put in a good word for me? And often what I'm looking for comes up. Like it's kind of freakish how often that happens. You can also buy little statues of Saint Joseph, which you're supposed to bury in the yard of a home you're selling to promote a quick sale. And when these little things happen, uh, these minor miracles, they kind of renew our faith in amazing ways. All right, so I have, I have one more miracle to share. Uh, and this is a story that shows that God is always listening and that he has a sense of humor and that sometimes, and that sometimes we can be pretty insensitive and you need a bit of a reminder. When I share the story with David, he thought it'd be a good idea to share with the congregation. I think he, he hopes this will get the heat off of him for poop shaming Bruno the dog. <laughs> so back when I was in high school, I worked at a now demolished Dairy Queen in Oliver. And of course we had a stereo in the back. And when we didn't have any good CDs to spin, 
uh, we would uh, leave it tuned to the local pop radio station, which back at the time was Magic FM, basically now Move FM. Um, so I'm in the back and I'm sweating there, tossing fries and stacking burgers when someone in the front says, hey, there's a dog lying down outside. So I poke my head outside and there was a, unfortunately a very old and very sick looking dog laying outside. He didn't have a collar, it was before my, microchips. He was likely abandoned, possibly because he was ill. We had a lot of transient fruit pickers that were through and they'd have to have dogs and they couldn't pay medical bills. So it was very sad. It didn't look well. Uh, we gave it some water and probably a burger patty and we decided we should call the SPCA. So some of the staff started talking about the dog getting nursed back to health and being adop adopted, but the, the dog was not well. It was definitely on its last leg and it was suffering. So it's unfortunately time for the dog to be put down. But some members of our team were really pushing that this dog was going to make a comeback. And I warned them, I was you know, trying to be realistic with them. I said, no, it's not going to make a full recovery and this is the best thing for it, but you know, it's going to be a sad outcome, I'm sorry. And I tried to explain that dogs have their time and this was this dog's time. But I was told that I was wrong and that this dog would be bounding through fields inside a week. So at this point, uh, I was not feeling heard. And so I decided, no, I'm going to start poking back. So I insisted that the dog would be put down. <laughs> and then they may, in fact, just do a drive-by in a van with Gangster's Paradise playing on the radio. Again, it was very insensitive. And I can, as an older person, see the error of my ways. But I thought I was being darkly funny. Um, it, again, wasn't kind. But I was feeling frustrated. And sometimes I get like to get a rise out of people. So I'm sure someone threw a pickle at me, which is like was the ultimate insult at a Dairy Queen, and retreated back to make uh, more burgers. And I, again, I genuinely felt bad for this dog, and I knew the SPCA was the best call and would do what would need to be done to make the dog comfortable. But my coworkers' unreal in expectations and inability to accept the reality of this situation frustrated me, and I made an insensitive response. And God was listening. After about 30 minutes, the SPCA rolls up. And first of all, I notice it's in a van. So I'm like, huh? Uh, and then they start attending to the dog as I'm again in the kitchen flipping burgers. And then I notice what song is coming from the radio. It was Gangster's Paradise. So <laughs> I made this really insensitive joke and out of the random airwaves of the internet, this song starts playing as a van rolls up. And I'm like, oh my goodness. So uh, again, it wasn't in the top 40 rotation. It wasn't a song that was regularly on the radio. I don't even remember hearing it on the station before. Like there was just too many things to fall in place for this to be a random uh, thing. So this was God's doing. He's like, hey, Brad, what you said was pretty mean, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I heard that. How about you be a bit nicer next time? And I know this is an example of the best like Christian living, but this example is like seriously stuck with me. It really imprinted. Uh, and it feels like a moment of, like I said, God is listening, God's watching, and uh, you know, he's keeping tabs on you. Uh, so it helped like really lock in my faith in this super odd roundabout way. Um, and again, I kind of appreciated the humor of the situation where he's teaching me a lesson by, uh, uh, again, sort of doubling down. I was insensitive and he's like, listen, you know, you got to deal with your consequences. Um, so humor is a language I often speak and I felt like that was a super personal message. Like it was very much directed at me. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to encourage you to reflect on your own Meyer miracles, the ones that build up your faith and reveal God in little things. Also, ask for miracles and signs. Not to test God, but because we delight in the wonder and mystery of Jesus. And be open to hearing the messages from God in different ways. I love God the jokester, so anytime I get God delivers jokes to me, it's very, makes me smile. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for all the little miracles, the mundane, the mysterious, the moving, and the minor. May we see you in the little things, and may those moments bring us closer to you. May we hear in all the ways you communicate, in shouts, cries, whispers, and laughter. Enrich us and help us grow closer to you. Amen.
your own mini miracles or even balls of consuming fire. And may you be encouraged, may your faith be built, um, and may you be inspired in God's mission. Amen.